Well, welcome to our series, Fruit of the Spirit. If you're just joining us, this fall we're focusing on two verses, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to memorize these two verses. So, so we're going to do a little pop quiz this morning, if we could. Uh, for those of you who are not part of us, don't feel any uh, guilt or pressure. For those of you who have been here the last two weeks, uh, feel lots of guilt and pressure. Uh, we'll just go ahead and, and try to recite this together. But here, here it is. Here's the, the focal passage of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Father, we are grateful for your word. We pray as we open it up today that you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. How do you know if you have the Spirit? Uh, what is the, the evidence... That, that indicates that you're spirit-filled. If you wonder, is God working in my life? I'd like for us to look today at how it is that we determine or discern whether or not God's Spirit is moving and working in us. One of the directions we might look when we think about the working of the Holy Spirit is toward what I call the, the sudden and the sensational uh, because what we find within the New Testament, we find throughout the book of Acts, uh, really beginning with, well, prior to that, but Jesus' resurrection was this very sudden and sensational event where the power of God comes into Jesus' physical body. Jesus rises up from the grave, and we find through the New Testament there are often times where the Spirit works in very sudden and sensational ways. There are these breakthroughs, there are these miracles, um, there are these imparting of, of supernatural gifts that are really beyond kind of human comprehension or explanation. Now, it was one time when I was a freshman in college, I was at a, a collegiate ministry service, a, we call a Baptist Student Union service, and in that service, I really don't have words to fully communicate what happened, but I sensed uh, within that service just something like a... a it was like a warm oil uh, just kind of flowing through me. It's kind of, kind of this, it wasn't like I didn't lose consciousness. It wasn't kind of this weird, strange thing. But it was a very unique thing that occurred in my life. And, and so I, I really believe it was done in the name of Jesus. It was something directly from the Holy Spirit. And there are times where God does show up and He shows out. And He works in very sudden very supernatural, kind of very sensational ways. But, but here's the, is the challenge. If we only look for the Holy Spirit to work in the sudden and the sensational, what happened for me is that that event that occurred in college, that took place a total of one time in my entire life. Uh, never had happened before, hasn't happened since. Now, God, I'm open to Him doing that at any point that He would want to, very welcoming of that. But the truth is, those sudden and the sensational works of the Holy Spirit, we read through the book of Acts. And as we read that account of the birth of the church, it feels as if there are these sudden and these sensational things that are occurring. I mean, boom, 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 all the time. In reality, Acts was written over the period of about 30 years, or the, the, the storyline spans about 30 years. And so if we just look for the Holy Spirit to work in sudden and sensational ways, we'll end up chasing something that obviously is something that is providentially given by God. It's something that He's sovereign over. We can't control. And if we do get that thing that we are wanting, we'll end up kind of creating this two-tiered system of I have the Spirit and you don't have the Spirit. And it's, it's really... a, a an unhealthy, I believe, approach uh, to understanding the Spirit's work in our life. And so what I would say is that, yes, the Holy Spirit does work in these sudden and these sensational ways, but He also works in another way. And that's the way I want to focus on this morning. He works not just in the sudden and the sensational. He works in the simple and the slow. And if you'll open with me to Galatians chapter 5... We're going to begin in verse 16, and we're going to see a picture here of the Spirit's work. And we're going to see here that it is not always a sudden and sensational. Rather, oftentimes it is very slow and it is very 
uh, still the way that it works and moves, the way the Spirit works and moves in our life. As we begin at verse 16, I want you to picture kind of two operating systems here that are vying for attention and vying for the loyalty of our heart. In Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, we read, and Paul writes, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And so we looked last week at the nature of the Holy Spirit. We asked the question, who is the Holy Spirit? And we said the Holy Spirit is a personal being, and not cousin it. The Holy Spirit's not a thing. And we asked this question today of the passage, what does the Holy Spirit do? If we understand his identity is a person, he's part of the Trinity, then we ask the question, okay, what is it in terms of his activity that he actually does? And we find in this passage really two operating systems. We have the flesh and we have the spirit. And what we were hardwired with from the time of Adam and Eve, we have our flesh. And we'll see the things that the, the, the flesh produces in contrast to this new operating system that's been placed within us. If we are, are born again, we have God's Spirit indwelling us, we now have access to a new source of power that can overcome the old operating system, which is our flesh. So let's see what the works of the flesh are. In verse 17, we see this contrast here. He says, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. So, so again, these are in competition with each other. And the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. And we should all be able to relate to this. There are times where we want to do the right thing, but darn it, I just can't seem to do it because there is this flesh that keeps tugging and pulling. And so while we do crucify the flesh, um, the flesh, again, because it's kind of hardwired in us, we default to that operating system. We draw life from it. And so he goes on and we see the acts of the flesh in just a moment. In verse 18, he says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. And this is not the fruit of the flesh. Paul mixes his metaphors here. The reason I believe he says deeds is because these are the things that we can do on our own. We don't need the devil to help us. We don't need a tempt, you know, we just can accomplish these on our own. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so this is the flesh. This is what the flesh produces. And then he moves into verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit. This is the new operating system that's been placed within the believer. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. In our home uh, at night, one of the things we'll often do with our kids, we'll play this game called Would You Rather? And it's a, it's a fun little game. You can always think of these hypothetical scenarios. And it's fun to ask them, you know, like, would you rather be able to teleport or fly? I don't know. Let's think about the benefits, benefits of both of those or... Would you rather be like super strong or super fast? And they think through, you know, which one would be the best. And the thing that makes the game fun is you try to find things. That it's difficult to choose between would I rather have this or would I rather have that. When we read this list here, if we frame it in terms of a would you rather... Hopefully it's easy, it's clear for us to see that the thing that we would rather have in our lives is the fruit of the Spirit versus the acts of the flesh. I mean, thinking about it personally in our relationships, would you rather be in a relationship with someone 
who was exhibiting the acts of the flesh versus someone who had the fruit of the Spirit. If you were going to be a business partner with someone, would you rather your business partner be someone who had the deeds of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit? If you're going to be on someone's team, would you rather have a teammate who exhibits the fruit of the Spirit versus the acts of the flesh? And to a person, all of us, when we examine what these lists are and the contrast between the two, we would say we want in our own lives and in the lives of people around us, we want the fruit of the Spirit. And, and where this draws back to the question that I asked in the beginning, how do we know whether or not God is working, whether His Spirit is moving in our lives? That there will be those times where God will work in these sudden and these sensational ways. But the list that's given to us here, the one that we would all prefer to walk in and have, most oftentimes this occurs not through a sudden and sensational thing. It occurs through a slow and a simple process. When we look at each of these and we say, God, are you working in my life? The way that we can evaluate and answer that question is simply by looking at this list. By understanding that here's what each of these are and here's what each of them mean. We look at this list and we say love here is from the term agape. And basically it means to desire and to do what is best for another person. We see that joy... Uh, means essentially that we have a deep gladness in something or someone other than ourself. We ask, God, are you at work in my life? We look for this evidence, this fruit of peace, which is an inner stability and strength. It's when we have harmony between what God says and, and how we feel. We look to find patience, which is really having a long fuse when provoked. I like the way someone has said it is the ability to wait without whining. We have kindness that is the strength to treat others well better than they treat us. We look to see the fruit of goodness, which is essentially being morally upright. We're not shady in our dealings. We have integrity. We have faithfulness. It means we are trustworthy and reliable. We're people who can be counted on. We're not fickle. I love the way Eugene Peterson defines this. He said, it's staying true and staying put for the long haul. God, are you at work in my life? We look to find the fruit of gentleness that is the strength to deal with others in a gracious way, regardless of how they have treated us. We look to find the fruit of self-control. Self-control, I like it defined as a safe space. It's this large buffer zone between temptation and and sin. It's when we have mastery over our impulses. Our impulses don't have mastery over us. And as we said before, we'll go back to this idea that there are some things in our life where when, when God shows up and He does these works, um, He can deliver us from an addiction. Um, he can heal us from a disease. And when we have an addiction, when we have a disease, when we have something, let us pray. God, would you bring your sudden and sensational work into my life? I see it in this book. I see it in the lives of other followers. And I want the work of your Holy Spirit in my life. But let us not be lured into this idea that that is the only exclusive, definitive way that God's Spirit works. Because this list here, if you and I are going to grow in love, in joy, in peace, in patience, most likely it's not going to happen overnight. Again, if there was a list, like you sign up on this list and God says, hey, I'm going to deliver you. You were harsh and overbearing. But instantly you're going to be gentle. Yes, Lord, bring that to me, right? I mean, any of these things, self-control. You were once a person who was kind of, you know, you just on impulse, can't control what you do. But, but you just went in an instant. God's going to grant you greater self-control. Yes, Lord, bring that to me instantly. We would all say absolutely. But our lives bear this out. Oftentimes, it's the case that those things happen in a gradual process. And so the, the truth today, I want us to grasp from this as we prepare to dig into the specific fruits of love, joy, peace, and following is this. 
that the Holy Spirit's work is often slow and simple. Not sudden and sensational. Now, it, it, it's both and. God does work in both ways. But again, if the only way that we're discerning whether or not God's working in our life is through the presence or absence of sudden and sensational things, we'll end up concluding, God, you're just, you're just not working. You're just not moving. I've been praying for this breakthrough. I've been praying for this miracle. It hasn't happened. It hasn't occurred. You must have left me. You're not at work. Well, in reality, these issues of character, they take time to transform. There's a reason why we, we talk about uh, salvation having different stages to it. There's the, the point of what we call justification or when we're, we're made right with God. It's instant there's the, the final kind of climax where we have glorification, where we're, we're, our physical bodies, we're, we're brought up into the image of Jesus. We're transformed fully and finally. It's instant. But there's this entire time span in between what we call sanctification. It's a long, grueling, grinding, steady process of flesh versus spirit. Spirit versus flesh. Some days the flesh is winning out. Other days the spirit is winning out. But it's slow. It's simple. There's an insight Paul gives when he writes to the church in Colossus, And he's praying for them in the first chapter. And in his prayer he makes this statement. And I'll read it to you here. He's, his prayer is that they would be strengthened with all power. And the root word for power here is the word dynamis. It's the word from which we get the word dynamite. So he's, he's praying like for this, this power from God. He says that you would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So, so the idea is that this resurrection power that raised Jesus up from the grave, that, that power would be at work in you and at work in me. But I want you to notice the end toward which Paul prays this power would be demonstrated. Now, we can pray that this power would be made known. I, I pray for this power in our nation. I pray for this power in um, every sphere of society. That the name of Jesus, the glory of Jesus, the greatness of Jesus would be made known for revival, for awakening, for spiritual renewal. And so we, we could pray that this power would be demonstrated and known in sudden and sensational ways. God, bring our hearts back to you. But I want you to see the end toward which Paul prays. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all. Paul, all steadfastness and patience. Isn't it fascinating? I mean, he's, he's praying for this, this might and this power, this strength from God to be mustered and put toward not a great awakening, but the everyday common believers who struggle with their nine to five jobs would have steadfastness and patience. So, so what we see here is that there is a need for, I believe, both the sudden and the sensational as well as the simple and the slow. And when we have um, ch ch charismatic workings, when we have the, the sudden and the sensational, without the character of Christ, it, it could often lead to chaos. And for the church in Corinth, the church Paul addressed several times and, and did not have very kind things to say to them, he told them in the first book that he wrote, 1 Corinthians, first letter that he wrote to them in the first chapter, he says, look, you do not lack in any gift. And you find later on in the book, chapter 12, chapter 14, like they were displaying all of these sudden and sensational gifts of the Holy Spirit. But what we find Paul communicating to them along about the fifth chapter 
is that there were things going on in the life of their church. He said, it's just, it's embarrassing. It essentially, there was one man who was sleeping with his, we presumed like his stepmother. I mean, just some really weird and bizarre things that the church was is involved with. And the point that Paul is making to them is that this, you've got the sudden and the sensational work, but you also need the simple. You also need the slow work of the Spirit transforming your character. And so if we look at the, the, kind of what's communicated to us here, the way we can apply this, I encourage you toward three things. The first is, number one, is we want to pursue the empowering of the Spirit. And would you let this just become personal for a moment? Don't think corporately, don't think about everybody gathered around you, but in your own life. Pursue the empowering of the Spirit through both the slow and simple and the sudden and the sensational. Knowing it's the same Spirit who produces both. Again, we lean on Paul for his insight into this. In his letter to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 12, he communicates to them about spiritual gifts and how they're to operate in those gifts. He follows that up in chapter 14 with more explanation of how these gifts, uh, some of which are revelatory, uh, kind of ooh-ah sign type gifts, uh, prophecy, uh, language of tongues. I mean, these, these gifts that we look at and they say, wow. But right in the middle of chapter 12 and chapter 14 is one of the most precious chapters in all of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 13 which talks about love. I think it's profound to me that sandwiched in, kind of in between Paul's instruction about the spiritual gifts, the miraculous breakthrough of God into our world, he says, don't forget this, the most important thing, faith, hope, remain these three. The greatest of these, he points them toward love. And so for us, when we think about how God is working in our life, God, let it be, bring about the sudden and the sensational. But at the very same time, the day in, day out work of your spirit is probably most likely going to be revealed in very slow and very simple ways. In 1926, um, there was a couple, Ira and Ann Yates, uh, lived out in West Texas, uh, kind of barren ground, rocky, dry, uh, just not much of anything there at all. And they were having difficulty uh, paying for their land. And so it said, according to the story, kind of on a whim, they called the Transcontinental Oil Company. So would you come out? Would you drill for oil? Well, they did. We went some 1,000 feet down into the ground. And what happened, as you can imagine, is that they, they hit what they call a gusher. And oil started sprouting up from the ground. Uh, so much so that they couldn't really contain it. Uh, they built a uh, kind of a dike off in a, a draw to try to serve as like a holding tank for all the oil that was gushing forth. Uh, it was hard for them to build tanks large enough because it just was sprouted. I mean, just coming out of the ground, out of the ground, out of the ground. Um, and it's today known as one of the largest producing uh, oil fields, the Yates oil field. Um, the last time I read about this, over 1.5 billion barrels of oil have been created uh, from that, that oil field. Uh, there are times where we might feel, you might feel, like that barren Texas kind of forsaken land. It may be today that your heart just feels dry, feels cold, feels hard. You're you're trying to do the right things. You're trying to go through all the right motions. But you know, you just kind of burn out. You look at certain relationships in your life, could be within your family, could be within your marriage, uh, could be your relationship with the Lord. It just feels like there's no life, it's dry, it's barren, there's just not much happening there. And if that's how you feel today, I, I would encourage you to cry out to the Holy Spirit. For him to pour some of the oil of his presence over your heart. For him to fill your heart with a hope 
of Jesus. For him to do something that, that it might not be an everyday sort of occasion, but it, it's just something sudden and it's something that you can't really give clear language to, but it is a, a clear moving and a clear working of his Holy Spirit. Personally, I believe this, that if God wants to, again, he is sovereign and providentially, he is the one who determines. We don't drum this up. We don't force God to do it. We don't twist his arm to do it. But if God sees fit to do it, God let it be. Pour out your spirit in any way that you would see fit. We want your spirit to flow. We want your spirit to move. And if your heart needs to be touched today, I would just encourage you to turn to him. And just understand that, again, if we want to be a church that is strong in the word of God, we're going to be a church that is strong in the spirit of God. And if you, friend, are going to be a believer, a follower of Christ, who is strong in the Word of God, you and I, we need to be people who are strong in the Spirit of God. And that means saying, God, you do whatever you will in my life. So it may be that you need a gusher. You need the oil of His presence to flow. In comparison to that, there's a man named G. Campbell Morgan, a preacher from years gone by, he said he was in Italy one time, and he was at a cemetery, and he observed there was a grave there, a marble slab, large grave. And he saw something as unique and odd. There was a, an oak tree that was growing up through the middle of that marble slab. And that marble slab had actually busted open because of the growth of that oak tree. Now, we can all envision this. If, if you take a marble slab and you put it up against an acorn, a hundred times out of a hundred, the marble slab is going to win. A hundred times out of a hundred, uh, the acorn is going to get smashed. It's going to get crushed by, by the marble slab. But if you take that marble slab put it in the right environment and you give it the things that it needs to grow a little sunlight a little moisture, a little rain a little nutrients over time an acorn will have the power to break through a marble slab I believe this some of you right now, your faith feels like an acorn. Your level of maturity, it feels like an acorn. Your self-control feels like an acorn. Your love feels like an acorn. Your gentleness, your kindness, your goodness, it feels like an acorn. It feels weak. And there are things that keep smashing against it and overpowering it and defeating it. And over and over and over, you're left with a sense of hopelessness like, how long will I continue being defeated by these certain things? But give the Holy Spirit of God enough time working in your life, feeding with prayer, with His Word, living in union with Jesus. Friends, there will come a point in your life where you will break through the things that are now breaking you down. You will be able to push through the things that are now defeating you. And this is, this is such an encouraging thing to know that there's, uh, none of us have arrived. But when I look at the way God works, when I look at some of the men and the women that I admire the most in the faith, the, the people who genuinely exhibit Jesus in the flesh, they may be people whose lives were marked with some an occasional, you know, sudden and sensational things that occurred. But for the most part, they were people who committed themselves to the slow and the simple. To day in, day out, walking with the Spirit. And what happened for them is over the course of time, Whereas they might have been impatient in their flesh, as the Spirit worked and as the Spirit, the, the strength, the might of the Spirit grew over their flesh, they developed supernatural patience. 
They developed, as opposed to uh, harshness or, or rudeness, they, they developed gentleness. Not instantly, but over the course of time, God worked and God grew them to the point that, and don't you love people when you watch and you see this evident in their life? I so say, thank you for, for that, God. They didn't get to that place on their own. They didn't muster it up. They didn't yield and let their flesh produce that. They partnered with the Holy Spirit to see two things happen. First of all, to experience the fruit of the Spirit, and then to express it. And so the primary thing I would call us to today is that we would seek and be open to both. That the, the flow of the Holy Spirit, if He wants to produce a gusher, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. But at the very same time, we're open and attentive to this truth that often God takes us from this place of being an acorn, and over the course of years and decades, He grows and He strengthens us. The second way that we can apply it, and this really goes right in with the first, it's number two, don't miss the simple, ongoing, powerful, day-to-day -day work of the Holy Spirit. Because you're only looking for Him to do something sudden and sensational. You know, the reason most employees get fired from their job, it's not because they lacked uh, some sudden and sensational work of the Spirit. It's because they lacked these very simple things here. The uh, reason most marriages will struggle is not because they lack these miraculous breakthrough type things. It's because... Because these things, the fruit of the Spirit is, is not present. We could go on and on. The reason most pastors uh, burn out of ministry, end up in a terrible situation, is, is not because they lack some kind of sudden and sensational power of the Spirit. It's because they're lacking in this slow and this simple work of the Spirit. And finally, I would encourage you toward, ask for the Holy Spirit to fight your flesh every day. Again, the language we find in Galatians 5 is, is that of walking alongside. It is an ongoing companionship. It is not a one and done. Next week, we're going to begin opening up, and one week at a time, we're going to discover the meaning of love, the meaning of joy, the meaning of peace, and, and how we apply those to our life. But just know this, that, that it, when you sign up to become a follower of Jesus, you sign up. To fight a lifelong battle against the flesh. As one old Puritan John Owen said, we need to be killing sin or sin will be killing us. If you find yourself frustrated, you've got these character issues and just, you just feel stuck. Hey, perhaps God's going to bring about something sudden and sensational, but most likely it's going to be the case that he says, hey, join me, partner with me, partner with my Holy Spirit, and watch how I take the acorn of your impatience and I grow it. Watch how I take the acorn of your rudeness and I grow it and transform it. Watch how I take the acorn of your self-centeredness and I grow it into love. Watch over the course of time. How it transformed you so that, and this is the prayer, that over time we would be able to defeat the things that are now defeating us.